Hello, everyone. My name is Serge Murakowski. I'm Director of Product Management here at VMware, responsible for Telco Cloud Operations. And I have the honor today to be with Dr. Mark Mortensen from ACG Research. Uh, both of us are going to be presenting to you the next generation's operations model for multi-services RAN and Edge network. Uh, Mark, if you'd like to say a couple of words. Hello, everyone. Mark Mortensen here. Talking to you from lovely Charleston, South Carolina, and working with VMworld here on the next generation operations model. And this is a particular discussion about the RAN and the edge network and what's going to be uh, changing and what is the, what are the requirements for operations in the future. Delighted to be here. I've been in this industry for about, oh, uh, I guess it's 42 years now. And I'll tell you, we're in one of the most exciting times of my entire career. So uh, looking forward to sharing uh, some of our comments here. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Looking really forward to, you know, pick your brain and your experience here uh, in this domain. Uh, but first, um, the disclaimer, uh, so the information and content that uh, we're gonna share with you folks today uh, contains some forward-looking information. So I just wanted to point that out. So um, Mark, what can you tell us with regard to how you see the market dynamics uh, going on uh, in this industry today? Well, there's just amazing things that are happening in the edge right now. We've had a lot of innovation in the in the industry for the last 40 years as we brought in more and more computer uh, software, computers into the into the area and automation in the area. But let's step back a minute and talk about what's going on overall, and then let's focus a little bit on the edge and the operations. Overall, uh, at the top of this chart, I talk about computing and storage is distributing to the edge. We've gone through this amazing time where all the premises computing, all the, all the computing was done on the premises. All the storage was done on the premises. We saw the public clouds coming over, up over the last 15, 20 years now. So we had public cloud computing and storage. Then we added hybrid clouds. We added the premises plus the public cloud together. Then we started adding multi-cloud. So it's, it's, there's a piece of uh, an operation that is gonna be on the premises, a piece that's over in Amazon, a piece that's over in, in, uh, in, in another public cloud. And now we're adding even a, a final piece there, edge cloud computing, where we're moving a lot of the computing very close to the customer here in the network edge. Uh, providing it there for mostly low latency. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But you know, Serge, you know this because VMware has been involved in this in this reaction and probably been the one of the main prime movers of the technology behind all of this virtualization and all of this cloud technology. Oh, absolutely. Um, I couldn't agree more. As, uh, as you know, VMware has been the leader in virtualization space, uh, starting way back um, in uh, in the enterprise space, and in fact now um, we're really uh, having a, a, a strong portfolio in the telco space as well. In addition to what we have in the enterprise space with virtualization and moving toward containerization of the infrastructure, but we'll talk more about that. Absolutely, and then all the operations that goes with it too. So let's talk about this then. So now we, we see some drivers here besides this computing uh, movement around, we see some other drivers and it's pr shown here on the lower right hand part of the chart. We were tremendous increased bandwidth needs, especially as people are working from home and as, uh, as the workforce is distributing. We're finding 5G being applied. We're finding a huge focus on the enterprise that's coming from a lot of the operators now, really believing that the enterprise customers are going to be where they make their increased revenue in the future. It's not really gonna be that much from the consumer side, it's coming from the enterprise side. We see the need for greater business flexibility and the uh, certainly these uh, communication service providers, the operators have been talking about how they need more flexibility. They need the ability to bring out new services very quickly. They need the ability to scale these services very quickly. And of course they want more control over their technology. Uh, the, a lot of the operators are very tired of actually having to uh, depend upon the vendors themselves. They're getting more involved in open source. They're getting involved in, in more partnering with the uh, with uh, vendors, like uh, especially like VMware, and having a lot more control of themselves over their own technology. Of course, they want to reduce costs, and of course, they want flexible and automated operations, a journey we've been on for the last 50 years. So here's the huge drivers, and it, it's it, it's more than ever true, especially in the edge of the network. So there's been three main areas now that are changing radically, uh, as I've shown here. 
Uh, first of all, in the middle on the left-hand side, we talk about network virtualization and going under software control. We talked about the, we talked about the clouds coming out. So how are we using those clouds? We're going from what's on the left-hand side of this of this particular box, talking about integrated hardware, software, network functions, and network elements. You'd buy a box from a vendor, and you'd buy an element management system, maybe, or maybe you just use command lines and configure that box. It was very cumbersome. We're moving over now to where we're taking that box and breaking it into two pieces. We're breaking it into the piece on the bottom, which is the container infrastructure, uh, which is running on the cloud, and the cloud architected network functions on top. So all of a sudden we have two boxes there instead of one box, one software, one hardware. And we're taking those EMSs and MSs and putting in these what we call software defined network controllers, which have a lot more functionality and a lot more direct control with a lot less human interaction necessary. So that's kind of the first thing. The next thing is network equipment disaggregation. So those individual boxes are being disaggregated both horizontally and vertically. Horizontally, we're seeing it happen in uh, the boxes breaking into multiple boxes. It's shown here as hardware one plus hardware two. So all of a sudden now what used to be one box is multiple boxes. Sometimes they're open source hardware. Uh, Sometimes they're, uh, well, they're often they're open source hardware. We're seeing that especially in things like the ORAN and the VRAN areas. We're seeing that in uh, a lot of the transport gear as, as these transport boxes are disaggregating into multiple ones. We're seeing a vertical disaggregation also as the software that used to be intrinsically in the hardware is being pulled out again and is being uh, is sitting there on top uh, and, and open some as an example of open source or, or an open programming environment that uh, others can come in. And similarly, control disaggregation, even in real-time control in things like the ORAN and things like the uh, RIC, if you're familiar with the RIC, uh, the uh, near real-time and real-time uh, control system for, uh, for the RAN networks. So we're seeing what used to be one box all of a sudden is disaggregating in multiple uh, horizontally and multiple vertical areas. And lastly, we're seeing, however, although we're talking about lots of more boxes, we're also doing some, some aggregation here as these special networks and the general network you used to have special networks if you had very high QoS requirements or special QoS requirements. When I say QoS, I mean quality of service, of course. So now we're going over to what's called a slice network. It's a single network with uh, elements that are shared among all the customers and all of the users and all the services yet you're able to slice up that network into different parts that have different QoS characteristics. So you can provide very low latency to some customers, very uh, normal latency, but very cheap service to other customers for things like IoT, uh, or very, very high bandwidth services to the customers that are needed. So there's both a disaggregation and an aggregation going on at the same time. And it's, it's, it's really all kind of um, amazing what's going on with all of this. Yes, indeed. Um, and, and in fact, um, with this uh, disaggregation that is taking place uh, with uh, hardware and software you know, combined together, um, it, it, it pro there's greater complexity as a result of that. And what do you think uh, is necessary from an operational standpoint to be able to manage uh, all of that, all of those different piece parts, hardware, software, and, and such? What do you see out there? Well, I see kind of like five major things that need to change here and some new requirements that are, that are coming out. First of all, it is more complex. It was complex to begin with. It was difficult to begin with, and it's even getting much, much more complex, which is why we're going to need an awful lot of automation here. So the first thing we need is integrated management. We really need to have an integrated management of this new computing infrastructure that's underneath here, the clouds uh, that are scattered all over the place, that are running, uh, that are the computers that are running all this software, and all the software uh, modules that are that are going to be distributed around. We need all the modules kind of handled together. We need the uh, and we need the infrastructure. So you have to monitor the infrastructure, monitor the other, and control the infrastructure and control the applications together somehow. Integrated management. Second of all. When we've disaggregated all these things, we need end-to-end -end service management. So it's not now, you know, customers don't really care about the boxes. They care about their service from end to end. So they want to be able to see that they're having a good set of a good service that is meeting the QoS requirements. What this requires now is a very service-centric way of looking at the network. You're not just looking at the piece parts, you're looking at how the services thread through all of these different piece parts in the software 
and in the underlying hardware and how it all works together. The third thing we need is cloud native integrated operational architecture. We need, we're going to, we're not going to have one single system that sits above and does everything, does all of the performance uh, and all of the assurance and all the provisioning and all the design. We're going to have multiple systems there. You, you have to. You have to have uh, probably a, at least a couple of hundred systems and some of the operators here, many hundreds of systems in order to make it work. But it has to be an overall architecture with very open APIs that allow us to plug these things together and provide automation that goes between them. So integrated operational architecture. All these things have to handle the 10x network. I, uh, that's what I call the 10x network because when I talk to operators about what do you need, they tell me, look, we need 10 times the scalability. We need one tenth the cost. We need 10 times faster operations. And we need the ability to bring out services about 10 times faster than we, uh, than we ever could before. So 10 in 10, 10, 10 uh, all, all along. So Mike, is it, uh, do, do you see that taking 10 years? To, to get there, what, what do you foresee? You know, I used to say it was going to take 10 years to do it. And, you know, the feedback I got from my operator friends is, no, you, it, we can't, we're not going to be around in 10 years if it takes 10 years. We need that probably in about half the amount of time. We need it in the next five years. And I've come back to them and said, you know, you're going to have to really rethink your whole operations in order to make that happen. And they say, yeah, we do. We have to rethink our whole operations and the way we handle it. And we have to move to my fifth point. We have to move to more AI powered, auto, uh, artificial intelligence powered autonomous network operations. That's a vision that was well articulated by the telemanagement forum uh, back in their October release of the AI of the AN2 uh, specifications, or I should really call it a vision, not a specification. And it really says, uh, it's a good architecture for how we're going to be running the networks in the future. Because you know what? We're not going to be running the networks of the future. They're going to be running themselves. That's what's going to make them autonomous. I couldn't agree more. I, I think you're spot on here with those five you know, requirements. Um, and, and especially the AI-powered autonomy uh, that you stated here last uh, is really going to be essential. So um, let me actually share what uh, we've been working on here at VMware with regards to addressing, because I do see the same thing. So I'm really happy to see uh, some good synergy with what you have. And uh, let's jump into what we are doing at VMware. So first, let me introduce um, what is our Telco Cloud portfolio, uh, which consists of four main products. We offer an infrastructure product called Telco Cloud Infrastructure. On top of that, we provide Tenzu that provides the Kubernetes infrastructure and administration for it, followed by Telco Cloud Automation that provides, as the name implies, automation, meaning the ability to provision, orchestrate this entire infrastructure. And then finally, to the left, you have Telco Cloud Operations, which is what I'm going to spend most of the time here to describe what it does and, and the values that it offers. So, so this is our portfolio when it comes to Telco Cloud. And it ranges from on-prem deployments, of course, to public cloud all the way to edge you know, sites as well. Uh, so all across the board that we provide an infrastructure and a portfolio that is rich, rich in, in features for our telco customers. Now, there are several benefits. Uh, and as you mentioned with the AI powered requirement, one of the key benefit is to automate this complex environments, uh, this multi-vendor, multi-domain environment with software that is capable of digesting all of that. You, you talked about scalability that is increasing tenfold. Uh, I also agree with that. So scalability is important in terms of the, the number of, of uh, devices, the size of the infrastructure, number of subscribers, number of devices, and all of that you know, put together. Uh, and the necessity to automate the overall process uh, to be able to offer automation and optimization for this environment. And all of that um, is, is done from an end-to-end -end standpoint. So going a little further into what Telco Cloud Operations uh, provides is we focus on three main areas in terms of the management. We focus on the fault management, uh, the ability to automatically identify faults, uh, to root cause them, 
on the performance management side in a similar fashion, being able to root cause those performance bottlenecks. And then third is the configuration management. What, what do you do all of that? How do you ensure that you have a stable infrastructure uh, that we offer to our customers on which services are put on top? Now, we focus not just on the virtualization space, but we also provide assurance in the physical infrastructure as well. So such as your transport you know, network. Uh, so the ability to go across and truly to provide end-to-end -end from your transport to your core and later in, into the RAN. That's so important, right? really end-to-end. -end. And I see a lot of elements here that are, some are virtualized, some are physical, and, and, and this is a real live, real world example, right? It is, it is. And in fact, I'm, I'm gonna show you um, an actual use case you know, of, of this. So what we're looking at here um, is an example of an infrastructure from your physical layer at the bottom with your routers and your switches, um, your uh, virtualization layer that also includes some uh, VMs and Kubernetes and CNFs and so forth, and then services you know, above all of that. In, in this particular example that I'd like to you know, show you is first of all, uh, being able to automatically identify a root cause. Um, in a typical operator environment, you would have tens if not hundreds of thousands of devices. And as you pointed out earlier, becomes a real nightmare to manage all of that. Nevertheless, the virtual you know, uh, layer on top of all of this. So what we offer is the ability to automatically identify a root cause, whether it is in a physical or virtual environment. And um, this is done with the automation, the machine learning that we have in, in a product, which means that it saves a lot of time for the operator. They don't have to go uh, investigate where the problem is, which can often take hours, in some cases, maybe days to identify a problem. Uh, furthermore, they're not inundated and distracted with thousands of events on the screen. Um, we show the actual root cause, we suppress all of those events, and we show the actual impact to the business if there is a service impact. Unfortunately, there's not always a service impact. So what we pro provide automatically out of the box is the root cause, whether it is happening in a physical infrastructure or in the software in the virtual layer, and uh, what sort of impact there is, if there is some impact uh, to the services or the customers on top of that. Now, what do you do with that? Uh, that's a big time saver, but now this is where further automation uh, really comes in. You need to be able to now take action. So what you have on the left of the screen is you have the ability with Telco Cloud Operations to invoke our orchestrator, Telco Cloud Automation, or other orchestrators, uh, to be able to remediate and or optimize the environment, uh, having the knowledge of the actual root cause, not having limited view of the symptoms. So we get right to the source in being able to remediate the actual problem, as opposed to looking only at symptoms or looking at the reduced scope of the environment. That's very cool. So, you know, if a person is needed there, that's okay. But if machines see what's needed to be, uh, to happen, maybe it can make, maybe it can make changes to the network through the configuration management and, uh, and immediately take care of the problem, or at least make sure that the customer never sees it, even if there's a network problem. Yeah. Yeah. And the last piece you mentioned, the customer never sees it is, is obviously crucial here. Uh, in order to maintain the highest possible SLAs. And the automation provides that. The automation also does this at a lower cost. I like what you said in your 10X, when you said you know, uh, 10X the, uh, the scalability, but uh, 10 times less you know, the cost. Um, the automation here is really focusing also on reducing these costs of, uh, to operationalize and in uh, such a, an environment uh, with the software, with the autonomous environment and software that we offer so that SLAs can be maintained high while having more competitive pricing uh, for their customers. So when we put it all together, um, you have a rich portfolio from infrastructure to automation 
and operations, all of that offering a single pane of glass that uh, shows across the infrastructure and provides insight into the infrastructure um, is number one. Number two is the ability to automatically identify the root cause in the environment, regardless of where it is happening. It could be happening in the core, it could be happening in a transport layer, in a physical, the virtual, it could be fault related, some equipment that fails that happens unfortunately often, or some performance bottleneck that is you know, taking place. And with that root cause, to be able to identify what is the service impact, if there is a service impact, would you predict also what could be the service impact if, if the problem is not taken care of you know, soon enough? Now, when you put one and two together, what you get is the ability to offer protection for the services and offer a high level of quality because with the automation, with a closed loop action, the ability to automatically identify root cause, what we are able to do with our portfolio is to really control and optimize this infrastructure to provide the necessary resources for the applications and services that are running and depending on this infrastructure and to continuously optimize, <coughs> excuse me, to continuously optimize the infrastructure in order to one, provide the highest possible SLAs to at the lowest cost and doing this, you know, automatically providing a service protection uh, that is unique to the market. So this is what we have, uh, Mark, and uh, shared with you what we uh, have been doing and what we're continuing to develop you know, in this space. Uh, what, what do you think uh, overall based well, on your experience? Thing, well, I think you, know, you guys are certainly on, on the right path here that's going to get us towards that autonomous network that we're looking for. You've got something that looks at all of these different, all this new technology, if you will, as well as the old technology. Because we know that it's not the whole network is going to be a, the old stuff plus the new stuff for a long time. Certainly, while I'm alive, uh, it's, it's going to happen, and I intend to be alive yep. for a long time. So, uh, so it, without a doubt, I think it, it looks like something that's very useful today with today's technology, but also exactly what we need for the future, all integrated together. So, I, I that's I mean, it's it's what the operators are telling me they're looking for. Well, glad to hear, and yes, indeed, we we can't forget the old stuff because as, as we know, uh, as uh, operators are, are building those, those new layers of uh, services and infrastructure, cloud and, and others, uh, they will continue to rely on the, um, the, the current infrastructure and investment that they've made over many, many years. And yes, it is one of the key values uh, that we offer. Uh, for example, we support over 4,000 different types of devices out there. So we are we have a very rich uh, solution able to manage the operations, whether we're talking about a legacy infrastructure or something that was just rolled in you know, today uh, to, to monitor the latest services. And uh, I know you spoke a little bit about ORAN uh, earlier. Uh, ORAN obviously is becoming more and more important to telco operators to offer a more standardized and, and open RAN platform, uh, which is also uh, quite important for VMware uh, as we continuing to offer a solution that will not only take care of the RAN and VRAN, but also the ORAN um, and, and the RICS you know, as well. So all of that is greatly important to VMware. We feel that we're very well positioned uh, having expertise um, in virtualization for many, many years. Uh, into the telco space and uh, really looking for an exciting future and working with you, Mark, on um, you know, move, moving forward in this really exciting time, as you said earlier. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. This is what we have. And uh, like I said, it's an exciting time. Uh, I think uh, Serge wants to invite you to take our survey. Yes, indeed. So um, please uh, take the survey next, uh, folks, and I hope you enjoy VMworld. 2021. Uh, Mark, I want to especially thank you for your participation and attending today. Greatly appreciate it to pick your brain and your experience in, in that space. And uh, I want to say thank you to everyone and uh, have a great VM world and uh, be safe, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.